How do you feel when you go to check the mail? When, when you get a letter in the mail, a card in the mail, how do you feel? What emotions go through your mind and heart as you check your mail? Do you go through and you sort through the different things that come in? What are some of the emotions that come, come to you? This, this is, is an interaction here. What, what, what emotions come to you? What feelings come to you? If I were to say, hey, you got a, a, a package in the mail. You got a letter in the mail. You got something in the mail. What, what comes to mind? Anticipation. Anticipation. Curiosity. Or junk mail. Or junk mail. Waste of time. What else comes to mind? Bills. Oh, well, if you get something that says IRS across the top, what type of emotions come into your mind? Fear, fear, anxiety. Jury summons. Jury, yeah, when you get a jury summons. <laughs> what, 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 what emotions come through your mind? Excitement. It, just recently, what was it? Excitement that it's an old friend. Excitement from an old friend. You know, recently I got this interesting letter in the mail. Uh, actually, I didn't have a picture of it. I, I wanted to take a picture of it. And it had tons of stamps on it. And so I looked at it a little bit closer, and it, these stamps, they were from India. And then I looked, and it said airmail on it. And I thought, what is this letter? Where did it come from? And so do you think I just, like, stuck it back in the mailbox? I'll tell you, actually, I've seen Leah do that before. Sometimes she'll go to the, the box, and there's so much junk mail that she says, I'm just putting that back in the mailbox. And she walks away. don't want to deal with it. <laughs> well, it wasn't one of those letters, so I immediately opened it, and it was a letter from Deepika Goya, who we sponsored an Adventist school in India. And I was so excited to read the letter from her. But you know, there's a certain time of year when Leah and the girls get really excited, and there are no envelopes, no letters that go back inside of the mailbox. And our refrigerator begins to look like this. This actually isn't our refrigerator, but our refrigerator now, if you were to come to our house and you saw the pictures on it, it begins to look like this. And every day she's excited and she'll tell me, did you go check the mail? I'm going to go check the mail because there's going to be a picture of somebody that we love there. There's going to be a family that maybe we haven't seen for a year. And we wonder, how's the family changed? What do they look like? We want an update. We want to see our friends. And she's excited to get those letters, excited for the surprise that's going to come in the mailbox. I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2 or to follow along on the screen. Matthew chapter 2, we pick up this story. Now last week we looked at the story of Zechariah. And in the story of Zechariah, we discovered that here was a man who was righteous in the sight of people. No, not so much. There was reproach towards Zechariah. There was feelings that, that there must be something hidden in his life. But in the sight of God, in fact, I didn't share this last week, but Zechariah and Elizabeth are the only ones that are called blameless in God's sight in all of the New Testament. But here in Matthew, uh, we pick up again this idea that it's been a long time since the prophets have spoken to Israel. And they know, they're anticipating that the Messiah is supposed to come. There's been the 490-year prophecy that's revealed through Daniel that, that the time has come. Messiah is on his way. It can't be long now. When suddenly something happens in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Right, so wise men coming from a distance, they've come from the east, they're coming and they come to the city of Jerusalem. Now, what would be some of the thoughts, some of the feelings, some of the emotions that you think you might be going through as you saw this happen, if you were in Jerusalem? Who are these people? Would there be some excitement? They're saying, hey, the king of the Jews has come. You would expect maybe some excitement, maybe some anticipation, maybe some, some interest in what they're doing. Here are these people that have traveled a long distance and they're coming into town to say, hey, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? Well, as they come into town and they begin to ask this question, we find something fascinating in verse 3. It's, it's not what you would expect from a people that have been waiting for 400 years to hear from a prophet. Not what you would expect from people for 400 years who have been longing for the coming of the Messiah. Actually, longer than about 500 years they've been 
looking forward to this. Actually, I mean, really since, since they were, we were taken out of the Garden of Eden. But look at what they say in verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. When Herod heard this, he, he heard the good news. Where, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Herod was troubled. And all of Jerusalem was troubled with Herod. Now, we might be able to understand why Herod was troubled. Herod is the one who paved the pathway to his throne with blood. Who would kill his own sons. In fact, it was said of Herod that it was better to be one of his pigs, because he was trying to please the Jews by not eating pigs, Better to be one of his pigs than to be his own son. Because he didn't treat his, uh, he slaughtered his own sons in order to protect his throne. So, so we might understand that, oh, maybe there's a, a, another king coming up. Maybe this is why Herod has this angst, this trouble in his heart. But why is all of Jerusalem troubled by the news that a king is come? Isn't this what they're looking forward to? Isn't this what they're expecting? Aren't they Adventists looking forward to the first Advent of God in human flesh? But they were troubled. And all Jerusalem was troubled with Herod. What's going on here? We can see this this heathen king on the throne. No wonder he's an Idumean. He's not actually of Jewish ancestry exactly. And, and, And he was put in place by Rome. Here he is on the throne. But all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. So he calls for the chief priests and the scribes to come. And as they come, he says, where is the Messiah going to be born? And they they open up to the scroll of Micah and they say, well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem because that's where the ruler is supposed to come from. And he watches as they point to the scrolls and they answer the questions that he's asking. And then he tells the wise men to go and to find him and then to worship him and then to come back and to tell him about this. So he sends off the wise men. The wise men go and they find Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, let's, let's take a, a moment just to sidetrack ourselves thinking about these wise men. They've been traveling for who knows how long, a long distance. They've come from a faraway land. And they've come hoping to find this king who's been born. And they come to the capital city. They come to the temple and nobody cares. Nobody notices. Nothing going on that, that's pointing to this king being born. Then they go to this tiny little town of Bethlehem. And they get there and they find as they go to this house, no longer in the stable, though the manger scenes like to make us think that. They're no longer in the stable because it says house here in, in Matthew chapter 2. And as they come to the house and they see this peasant family, a carpenter and his wife, nobodies, and they see this baby, or maybe he was a year or so old at this point in time, as they see this, their response is to worship him, to, to lavish gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh on him. They, they see something that, that everybody else is missing, that everybody else can't get. They see what God is all about. They see what the glory of God really looks like. Well, they are told in a dream not to go back to Jerusalem, not to tell Herod about their business. And somebody pointed out this morning that maybe they'd had that in the back of their mind. Maybe they'd already been thinking that and God confirmed it by a dream. We don't know exactly, but they don't go back. And so how does Herod respond? That king who's worried about his throne. Herod responds in verse 16 by it says, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. This guy who, he just blows his top. This is a guy who has an issue with his temper. He's exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. It's a, a horrific story. It's, it's, it's this Nasty blight on the beginning of the life of Jesus. And, and we know that he was trying to destroy Jesus, but thankfully, Joseph had been given a dream and they had gone down to Egypt to escape this. But I picked up the book Desire of Ages and I was reading through this story. And it suddenly began to unpack something for me that, that I hadn't quite seen so clearly before because I knew the nature of Herod. But I hadn't thought about how the chief priests and scribes had had fed into 
what was going on inside of Herod, what had led him to this point. Check this out uh, from the Desire of Ages, page 65. It says, they, being the, the scribes and Pharisees, the Jews, they had searched for prophecies which could be interpreted to what? To exalt themselves and to show how God despised all the other nations. So they, they read the prophecies. They, they would memorize the Pentateuch, some of them. They, they knew the Bible so incredibly well. And they were searching it to show why they were in the right and everybody else was wrong. They were searching it to exalt themselves to show how God hated everybody else. That's how they read the Bible. They read it seriously. It it would put to shame how most any of us take time to study Scripture. You know, I remember being back in Israel and going into a synagogue. And even to this day, you watch them as they are there copying the Torah. And as they're copying the Torah, like, they have to wash their hands in a special way. They, they, they look at this as such a, a, a sacred book that you can't touch it. In fact, one of our people in the tour touched it, and they were saying, no, they're going to have to restart the whole thing because one of your group touched what he was writing there. They meticulously watch for every single letter. They're, they're treasuring the Word of God so they can exalt themselves and despise other people. Notice what it goes on to say. It says this, It was their proud boast that the Messiah was to come as king, conquering his enemies and treading down the heathen in his wrath. They said, you just wait, Rome. You just wait. You, you can imagine them telling the Roman soldier who told him to carry his burden for a mile. He said, you just wait till the Messiah comes. He's going to get you, man. You just wait till the Messiah comes. And, and Herod, Herod knew this. Notice what it goes on to say. Thus they had excited the hatred of their rulers. Why did Herod hate the Jews? Why did the Romans hate the Jews? Because the Jews said, you just wait. You just wait. Our Messiah, he's coming to destroy you. You just wait. He despises you. Through their misrepresentation of Christ's mission. What a horrible misrepresentation of what Christ came to do. He came to heal. He came to minister to them. If a centurion called for him, he came to the centurion. He did not come to destroy the heathen. He came to minister to their needs. Satan had purposed to compass the destruction of the Savior. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that that the dragon was wroth with the woman and that when the male child was born representing Christ, that he was seeking to devour that child. And if you study that in Revelation chapter 12, the, the dragon represents really what Satan was doing through the kingdom of Rome. And he was seeking to devour Jesus through Herod. But notice what it says. But instead of this, it returned upon their own heads. Do you see that? Why was it that all of those innocent infants were destroyed in Bethlehem? It was because of their wrathful picture of the Messiah. It was because they said, he's coming to destroy. And so Herod said, before he destroys me, I'm going to destroy him. Well, he's still a baby. A baby born in a manger who was coming to heal and to minister to the needs of God, of all people. How did they miss it? How could they have missed it? You think about many of the Old Testament prophecies that they must have just skimmed over. They must not have liked to dwell upon, but Isaiah 60 is one that comes to mind. I read the first two verses at the beginning today. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Is that the word? The world we're living in today, it's dark. There's a lot of darkness. If that's the world that, that Jesus was born into, it was at a height of darkness at that time. But the Lord will arise over you and His glory will be seen upon you. They probably liked reading right to that point. And then they probably skipped the next verse says, For the Gentiles shall come to your light. The Gentiles are going to come. They're going to see a light and they're going to come to it. And that started with the wise men who saw a star in the sky and and they followed that long journey to come and find this king who was for them too. He's for everybody. 
and kings to the brightness of your rising. Verse 5 then goes on to say, Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. You see, they were troubled when they found out that the Gentiles were coming and telling them that the king had been born because they weren't truly recognizing the glory of God as revealed in the Old Testament. They weren't recognizing what God's character is like. And so they were troubled by the events that were going on that were actually pointing to Jesus coming. And your heart shall swell with joy. If only they'd recognize the character of God. They would have been ready for his coming. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. If only they'd read this, they would have known when wise men come into town saying, where is he who's born king of the Jews? And they have wealth with them to give to him. This is fulfilling the Old Testament. This is exactly what's supposed to happen because he's a savior for everybody. But when we become exclusive and we make God out to be waiting to punish the impenitent, when we look to him as a wrathful judge rather than a father who is merciful and gracious, we end up we end up missing Jesus. <laughs> you know, the disciples had a similar problem. You find that there's several different times when they were troubled. When Jesus shows up to help them in the midst of a crisis, notice this. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24 says, But the boat was now in the middle of the sea. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus sends them off to cross the Sea of Galilee while he goes up on the mountain to pray. But as, as he's watching, the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. They're in trouble. The, the wind is contrary. The waves are tossing the boat back and forth. Things are, are spiraling out of control. Have you felt like that any time recently? <laughs> felt like life is buffeting you around? If you haven't, you probably will next week. So they're there in the middle of the sea like this. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking in the sea. This is good news. Here comes Jesus. He's on his way. And friends, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have an awesome message to tell the world. Jesus is on his way. The question is, when I tell somebody that, who do they think this Jesus is? Or who do I think it is? And does it awaken in them feelings like Herod? Where they're troubled by it? Or does it awaken in them feelings of joy that their hearts are overflowing with joy that the Savior's coming back? So Jesus comes walking on the sea. Now notice what happens. As this beautiful Savior comes walking to them. And verse 26, And when the dis disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were what? Woo! Here comes Jesus! <laughs> the only one who can save him out of their mess. And they are troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. You see, when, when our picture of God, our understanding of His character is not one of a perfectly loving God, when we come in contact with difficulties, in the midst of it, when God comes to rescue us, we, we're troubled. We don't even recognize what God is doing, just like we saw with Zechariah last week. They cried out in fear and said, it's a ghost. As Jesus came to help them. Because they'd never seen something like this. It was unexpected. Why is he walking on water? Does he really have that capacity? Is he really that good that he would walk across the water to save us? Jesus really is that good. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. This is what your God is like. Be of good cheer. It's me. You don't have to be afraid. You can know that I am on your side. Notice in verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Once Jesus was in the boat, the storm stopped, and God is longing to do that in our lives. He's longing to show up, and He's longing for us to see who He is. That makes all the difference as to whether we are excited about His coming or whether we are troubled by the idea of His coming. And, and we have a special calling in Seventh-day Adventists to represent to the world, as Christians, to represent to the world how good this God is who's coming back for us. What an incredible God of mercy and love and justice He is as He comes back with His reward with Him. One more time, we see the disciples troubled. They had gone through a troubling experience. They had seen Jesus on the cross. And their understanding of 
of what was supposed to happen led them to actually run from Jesus, turn from Jesus, and then they hear these rumors that he's been resurrected. But they're terrified, and so they're holed up in the upper room. They're afraid of the Jews. They're, they're hiding in the upper room, John's Gospel tells us. But notice in Luke chapter 24 what happens. Luke 24 verse 36 says, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. Jesus shows up to tell them what? Peace. I'm bringing peace to you. I've overcome death. He's coming to give them good news. I'm bringing you peace. Now notice what the disciples are thinking as God is telling them, I'm bringing you peace. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. They are troubled. Because they don't really know who Jesus is. It's unexpected. He's done something greater than they imagined. He's that good. He's overcome death. We want to not be troubled in our lives. We've got to come in contact with a loving character. We've got to see God's loving character in all of its beauty, and it's revealed most clearly in the life of Jesus. Jesus said in John 14 that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The way that I live, the way that I act, the way that I treat people, that's exactly how God operates. We're one in character and purpose. Verse 38, so Jesus said, and <clears throat> said to the disciples as they're terrified and afraid, he uses the same word troubled. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? You know, I have to ask myself that a lot. <clears throat> this past week, I got a, uh, an email that, that brought doubts, that brought discouragement, that brought fear into my mind. And I remember going back and forth uh, with somebody on, on these emails, and as I was trying to consider, trying to work out a solution for myself, I felt troubled. In fact, Leah could tell you that night, she's like, what's going on? I said, I'm just troubled about this situation. There was a couple different situations. But you know what? Looking back a few days later, I suddenly realized, you know what? I think God is working this out for good. I think that all of this is going to turn around for my good in the end. I think that everything God was doing was actually for my benefit. Why wasn't I trusting Him all along? Why didn't I believe what James says in James 1.17 that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shifting shadow, never changing. He's always giving good gifts. And He works everything together for our good. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? It's Jesus. The one that we can trust. You know, it's fascinating. <clears throat> a study was done by Andrew Newberg, a neurologist who is famous for his, his work. He's, he's a preeminent neurologist who's working in the area specifically of neurotheology or understanding how the brain reveals God at work in our lives. And he has a book, How God Changes Your Brain. I, caveat, I have not read the book. <clears throat> I read a review about it, and I read about the research, and so I'm just going to share you a little bit about it so I don't endorse the whole book or anything like that, but this study was fascinating. He did a study using brain scans and using surveys of people's experience, all the way from Catholic nuns to Sikhs to other people in their experience of prayer. He found fascinating things out about prayer. He found out that just 12 minutes of prayer can actually increase your ability, your, your age span, how long you're able to live. Just, just daily spending time in prayer. And as he did brain scans, studying people's brains, as they're contemplating God, as they're taking time in prayer, he found this. Contemplating a loving God rather than a punitive God reduces anxiety, depression, and stress and increases feelings of security, compassion, and love. And here's the, the science that he goes on behind that to, to say. This is actually in a review about it by Michael Gerson. Contemplating a loving God strengthens portions of our brain. So in the brain scans, they found that, that portions of, of gray matter would actually increase as they were contemplating a loving God. Particularly the frontal lobes. We recognize that's an important part, right? The frontal lobes and the anterior cingulate where empathy and reason reside. As you contemplate a loving God, 
These things strengthen in your brain. But the converse of that, the opposite of that, is contemplating a wrathful God empowers the limbic system, which is filled with aggression and fear. Well, think about Christians today. Think about some of the things that Christians are teaching today. You know, some of it is based on one of the America's most famous servant, sermons. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, Jonathan Edwards has some beautiful things to say about God. He has some incredible things to say about God. But this is his most famous sermon, and he's well known for this. Notice how he, what he said in the midst of the sermon. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much in the same way as one holds a spider or something loathsome, or some loathsome insect over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. (laughs) That's how God sees you. He's of purer eyes than to bear to have you in His sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in His eyes. Sorry, I got that messed up. In His eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. Amen. Let's go have uh, potluck, huh? <laughs> Just kidding. There's no potluck today. Does that, that, does that encourage you to open your heart up to this, this God who, who, who is coming back for you? Now, we might say, well, that's Jonathan Edwards. He lived back in the, what was it, the 18th century? Try this. I'm going to put a quote up by John Piper who has this amazing website, Desiring God. And, and I've learned so much through him about delighting in God. And, and I was horrified when I realized that, that this is the type of stuff that he teaches. Notice this. It's in response to the question, does God love the sinner while he hates the sin? Do you believe that? Does God love the sinner while he hates the sin? It is just not true to give the impression that God doesn't hate sinners by saying he loves the sinner and hates the sin. He does hate sinners. He hates now here is the paradox. He loves and at the same he, and he loves at the same time. For God so loved the world that he hates. Hold up. Have you read John 3:16 lately? Does it say for God so loved the world that he hates? No, it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and furthermore verse 17 says there is no he he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. But this is the type of stuff that the Christian world is feeding to people, saying you are loathsome to God, you are hateful in God's eyes. Is sin loathsome to God? Yes. Is sin hateful to God? Yes. But you are not. God loves you and He adores you and He desperately wants to separate you from your sin. And you can only do that by turning like we looked at last week. In order to live. You can only do that by coming to Him for healing. You cannot make yourself right in order to get back to God. It never works. It never will. It goes on to say, hate and love are simultaneous as God looks upon hateful, rebellious, corrupt, loathsome, wicked, God-dishonoring sinners. I want you to contrast that with one of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is, this is our heritage as Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White writes it this way, the shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us for it savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us that we may be compelled to right action through fear? Is it necessary? Do you need to know that He's got terrors in store for the ungodly? It is not necessary. It ought not to be so. Jesus is attractive. He's full of love and mercy and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. He says to us, I am the Lord your God. Walk with me and I will fill your path with light. Jesus, the majesty of heaven, proposes to elevate to companionship with himself those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. Friends, this is the picture of God that I want to share with the world. And I have to recognize that when I come to somebody's door, when I come to somebody at work and I tell them, 
you got to get back to church. you got to get back to God. They may be picturing a Jonathan Edwards sermon that I'm inviting them to go to. They may be picturing a John Piper type of God that hates them while he loves them at the same time. But that isn't who God is. That only leaves people troubled. And it leads us to strengthen the limbic system when we are afraid of God in that way, when we're terrified of God's judgments. And it leads us in our life, those studies went on to find by Andrew Newberg, to live lives of aggression and, and, and to, to lash out ourselves. But notice what Jesus says in context of the end. He warned us that the end was coming. He warned us that there would be signs. He warned us that the world would look crazier than COVID. And this is what he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Jesus does not want you to be troubled. He wants you to be aware the world is not going to get more and more rosy. But he doesn't want you to be troubled because you know who he is. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. It's going to spiral out of control, but see that you're not troubled. In John chapter 16, where it's John's version, really, of this apocalyptic prophecy of the end of the world, he ends it by saying, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but take heart. Don't be troubled. I have overcome the world. In John chapter 14, to disciples who he's just told they're about to deny him, that they're all going to forsake him, he says, but don't let your heart be troubled. Don't focus on who you are. But recognize that in my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. You who are about to betray me, you who are about to deny me, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. When you get a letter like that, it's exciting to open. And I want to propose to you that God wants day by day for us to experience that when we come to the Word of God. Over the past few years, I've discovered that reading the Bible gets more and more exciting. The more and more that I realize that from cover to cover, this is the story of a God who's crazy about us, a God who wants to save us, a God who will do anything possible to rescue us from our sin. That's, that's the story of the Bible. Genesis 1 and 2, he creates a perfect world. Genesis 3, we forfeit it. The rest of the Bible all the way until the last three chapters of Revelation are the story of how he's getting us back to finally restore to us what he had originally given us, and even more. The whole Bible is the story of redemption. And so if I'm going through the Bible and I'm, I'm getting distracted and I'm beginning to look at these facts and figures and things that, that don't point me to the cross of Jesus Christ, that don't point me to his salvific work in the great controversy, if I don't find that every time that I open the Bible, I have to realize something. I'm distracted. And I have the propensity, the, the, the probability of becoming troubled in my life. And when things don't go quite the way I want, I'm likely to be troubled. And when I read a difficult passage in the Scripture, I'm likely to be troubled by it because I don't realize that Peter promised through the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 3 that God is not willing that any should be lost. I have the infinite God of the universe. Paul said in in Romans chapter 8 verse 31, if God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, how would He not with us, with Him, graciously, freely give us all things. So practical tip that's been making the Bible so much more exciting for me. I mean, literally, like, I used to hate reading through the minor prophets. I'd do it because I wanted to read through the Bible. (laughs) Now when I read it, more and more I'm realizing this is a beautiful God who is working to save his people. Do you see? Did you catch that? Did you? There's so much here. It becomes so exciting when you see This infinite God of love who's writing this love letter to you. So I want to challenge you to pray this simple prayer. The psalmist prayed it, Psalm 143, verse 8. I like to pray it many nights before I go to bed, asking God to please do this for me the next morning. I say, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For in you I trust. 
And maybe you want to expand that prayer. Cause me to hear your, your loving kindness in the morning and throughout the day. And then as you wake up in the morning and you open your Bible and you go to read and to pray, say, God, as you read through that difficult story, how did this just reveal to me your loving kindness? How does this reveal to me that God saves? How does this reveal to me Jesus, whose name means Yahweh, saves? And the Bible will become more and more and more alive to us as we recognize Jesus on every single page, that we recognize that the Bible is about His salvation work. It's a love letter to us. This past week, I went to the pastor's meetings up in Clovis, and my family was supposed to come with me, but unfortunately, uh, the girls had a cold, and they were on the tail end of some of the symptoms. And let me tell you, uh, anyway, I won't go into detail, but it, if you have symptoms this day and age, don't go in public. <laughs> People will run from you, <laughs> which is probably good. Um, but anyway, <laughs> maybe. Anyway, so we decided, okay, we can't take the girls to this retreat. They still have some symptoms that might be scary to people. And so I, I remember on Tuesday morning, I was rushing to get out the door when God put something in my mind. I said, you know what? I need to write these girls a note. So I went to, they have these little notepads that they like to draw on, and I, I pulled little, little scratch pieces out, and I, I wrote on there, Daddy loves you. I miss you so much. I put some hearts and X's and O's and other things on there. Anyway, I put two notes, one for Abby and one for Livy, and, and I said, okay, where should I put this? And Leah came in. I said, I'll put these in the pajama drawer. She said, yeah, that's perfect. So I took the notes. And I put them in the pajama drawer. How do you feel when you receive a love note? I can tell you how my daughters feel. In fact, you can just watch and see for yourself. Daddy, I got my note. Daddy, I got my note. What do you want to tell him? I love you. It says I love you. See you tomorrow. That type of joy. That's the joy that God wants you to feel when you pick up the Bible. Knowing that He's your loving Father, that He's coming back for you soon. You're going to see Him soon. And He's coming back as a God of love. If you'll only open up your heart and allow Him to separate you from your sin. Last week we looked at the story of Fanny Crosby. And we looked at how she had written 9,000 hymns. And we saw that at six weeks old, a doctor had put this potion on her supposed doctor, and, and she had ended up blind. And how we saw a minister had come to her and said, I wish that if God blessed you with all these other things, that at least he would have blessed you with your sight. And she said, if I could ask God for one thing when I was born, it would be that I had been born blind. Because the first sight, first face that I shall see will be the face of my blessed Savior. She wrote so many beautiful, beautiful hymns that we appreciate. But here's the thing. She often didn't compose the music that went with those. But musicians would come to her and they would ask her to give give them the lines for the music. So I wanted to share a story about a guy named William Doan, a musician, dropped by her home for a surprise visit. And he begged her to put some words to a tune that he had recently written for an upcoming Christian convention. The only problem was that the train for the convention left in 35 minutes. So he said, "Um, could you help me out here? Could you help me to write music or to to put words to this music for this, this Christian convention? Well, this is what Fanny Crosby did. Your music says safe. In the arms of Jesus, Crosby said, scribbling out the hymn's words immediately. Read it on the train and hurry. You don't want to be late. Said, You're, the words are, are simply this, safe in the arms of Jesus. And that hymn goes like this. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on His gentle bless, breast, there by His love overshadowed, sweetly my soul shall rest. Hark to the voice of angels, born in song to me over the fields of glory, over the jasper sea. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on His gentle breast. There by His love overshadowed, sweetly my soul shall rest. Now here's the fascinating thing. Fanny Crosby was a little bit like those scribes and Pharisees who had memorized large portions of Scripture. The same article says that while she enjoyed her poetry, 
She zealously memorized the Bible, memorizing five chapters a week. There was one year where I tried to memorize one verse every day. I didn't keep up. It was too hard. She memorized five chapters a week. Even as a child, she could recite. As a child, she could recite the Pentateuch. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Gospels, Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, and many Psalms, chapter, and verse. She too memorized large portions of Scripture, and she recognized that what it's all about is being safe in the arms of Jesus. She overflowed with a blessed assurance, another hymn that she wrote. She overflowed with the goodness of God. And we all have a choice. First of all, do we pick up the Bible? And second of all, do we read it like the scribes and Pharisees? Or do we read it like Fanny Crosby did? Do we internalize the fact that God is love? I invite you to pray that prayer. Psalm 143, verse 8. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. In fact, I just invite you to bow your heads right now. And just have a moment between you and God and say, God, I really truly want to see your loving kindness every day. Father, we want to see your loving kindness. We want to know you. We want to see your character because we recognize that this and this alone is what will see us through in the end. This and this alone will enable us to handle trouble and not be troubled ourselves. And Father, there's a world out there that needs to know that Jesus is coming back. Would you enable us and empower us to show them who's coming back? what this Messiah is like, who this King of Kings is like, that He would lay down His life for everyone. Father, would You fill us with broader and bigger conceptions of Your incredible love for us. And may this turn us from sin to righteousness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.